It's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for this afternoon. Um, our keynote speaker is Dr. James Tomino. He's a board certified internist and clinical informatician, professor of medicine, and the inaugural director of the Informatics Institute at the University of Alabama at Birmingham School of Medicine. He's the co-editor of a leading textbook on biomedical informatics and the associate editor of the Journal of Biomedical Informatics. Um, he has numerous honors and awards and publications um, that would take me the rest of the afternoon and longer to, to acknowledge. Um, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Camino. Camino. Thank you for that introduction and uh, for cutting out all the boring parts and uh, also for the invitation to come and speak here to you today. Um, let me get right into it because I'm the one that's keeping you from the beautiful day outside. Uh, so first I'll start with a disclaimer. Uh, despite undergoing pretty much every sort of dental procedure, uh, I have claimed no special knowledge of dental informatics in general or electronic <laughs> dental records in particular. However. I think EDRs and EHRs are, uh, have some commonalities. They serve the same basic goals. Uh, they suffer from the same basic shortcomings. And they're related to care of the same species. So with that, let me talk about electronic health records and let you extrapolate a little, little bit. But uh, at the end, I, I actually had some insights that I got from uh, uh, lunch conversation. And uh, I can bring it around to make it a little bit more relevant to dentistry. All right, so I'm going to cover a bunch of different topics at whatever speed I have to talk to get through in 45 minutes. Uh, first, a little inventory of what electronic health records do right, what they do wrong, how we got in this mess in the first place, and what should EHRs be doing. And then I have some thoughts about a missing link that I'd like to share with you for the evolution of electronic health records. And uh, without getting too much into the informatics -y stuff, uh, maybe g uh, give you some insights into where I think things are headed. Okay. So what do EHRs do right? They do billing, okay? So they're, they're very good at that. In fact, that's the main reason hospitals buy computers is so they can do billing. And, and it's easy to justify the cost if they do, if they can, uh, if they spend a million dollars on a system that gets in $10 million in billing, good return on investment. Um, legibility, so records are generally legible because they're typed uh, and they are printed in, you know, in clear form and they're generally available. Um, although, you know, with power failures and such, you can have trouble, but it beats the uh, old days where there was one copy of a paper record that if you couldn't find it, uh, you started a new copy, and then the, then the old one would show up, and then you'd have to merge them, and you never knew if you had the most recent copy or not, and uh, of course, only one person could have a copy of it at any one time. They do results reporting pretty well now. I think we've got that pretty well, because the second place where, hosp where uh, health systems got computers was in the laboratory. The pathologists actually were the first informaticians uh, because they brought able to bring laboratory instrumentation uh, and computers together to start reporting the, uh, the results of tests they were performing. Um, they do order entry. Uh, as much as we hate doing it, as much as tedious it is, uh, they, they do allow us to do order entry and generally get it right and certainly handle the communication of the orders. And they do alerts and reminders. And some of those they do right, some of them maybe not so right as I'll talk about a little bit later. So alerts and reminders, what do they do wrong? They do alerts and reminders wrong uh, because they fire too often. So we have an alert at, uh, at our institution that fires when you are ordering a repeat test, a repeat blood test. If the blood test had been done recently, uh, that is one of the leading alerts that we have, and it's overridden 97 to 98% of the time. So you got to think about if you're getting hundreds of these alerts a day, not individuals, an individual might get 20 or 30 alerts a day, and you're overriding it most of the time, the next alert you get, you're just gonna go click, get rid of this, get rid of this. And you're gonna start ignoring the ones that are important. So that's alert fatigue. Data entry is very tedious and often redundant. So we spend a lot of time writing things or typing them. Uh, it gets pretty slow, uh, slower than just scribbling it on a piece of paper. And we often have to do uh, redundant data entry because as we add new functions to the electronic health records, each function needs its own data, and it doesn't, for some reason, it isn't able to use the data that was already collected because it's not quite the right way. So rather than go back and fix the first one and make it work, serve two purposes, they say, well, just add more data here. So 
blood pressures are all over the place, the weight of the patient is all over the place, uh, problem lists are all over the place in the record, so they're not consolidated, and we end up entering the same data over and over again, which of course is inefficient. Uh, records are incomplete, so uh, part of this is the interoperability issue that Doug Fritzman talked about earlier today. Uh, we have uh, fra you know, fragmented care, and so you go sit down in front of a, um, a computer screen and you're looking at a patient, you may not have the entire record. Um, there's, but despite that, there's data overload. So we're generating more and more data. Uh, in particular, in medical records, we get this problem called note bloat, where we write these notes that bring in just everything, with, and we can often cut and paste from a previous note. So people are post-operative day four for like two weeks. Uh, and we bring in all their problem lists, even the one, things that aren't inact that are, have been active for, inactive for years. And um, you get this note that has everything in it and you can't read it. You can't see the forest for the trees because there's just so much in there and you don't have time to read every line and figure out what's the new thing that's in there, what's the important thing that's in there. And there's poor navigability. So things are, there, there's data all over the record. The system we use, I, I, I'm new at UAB. I started working in the clinics there and I watched the house staff trying to find data and for some reason, if you say, well, show me the most recent laboratories, it'll show you the last three days of laboratory. Well, that's fine if there are any, but if there aren't any, then it's just blank. And then you have to go, well, was there more than that? And you have to click something that says show older data. You think it would be smart enough to say, oh, well, there's nothing in the last three days, but maybe you'd like to see something from last year or something like that. So we've got some navigability issues that we can work on. Okay, enough of the bullet slides. Um, let me show you how we got into this mess in the first place. So this is a... a part of an article, 1968 New England Journal of Medicine, Medical Records that Guide and Teach. It actually was a two-part article published in two separate issues, uh, but it was the same article um, by Larry Weed, and he was promoting the problem-oriented medical record. So if you've heard of that term, this is where it came from, because before this, we simply used medical records to uh, write down what happened that day. So here's uh, an example, some examples that Larry Weed had. And these are just little snippets. It's a little diary. So I'll read the middle one here. It says, 10 o'clock urine, 2 to 3 plus slash 0, given 10 U reg ints at 12.30 p.m., temp down to 38 question mark, suctioned NT uh, with little return. However, during suctioning, PT, sorry, uh, anyway, you get the idea. So it's a little record of what happened to the patient that day. It doesn't say what they're doing. It doesn't say what they're thinking. It doesn't say when they're going to send the patient home or what the goal is. It just says, here's what happened, here's what we did. And the next day, here's what happened, here's what we did. Now, if you're trying to figure out what's going on with the patient, you read the whole thing and you get the whole story. And if you're tracking along, you go, oh, they were probably thinking they were going to do this. And oh, yeah, here they did it. And then they're probably going to do this next thing. Gee, they didn't do it. I wonder why not. Oh, here, it turns out they waited a day. The, you could read that, but it's like reading a diary. You don't get a good sense of what the thinking was of the clinicians. So here's Larry Weed giving a talk in Emory. Uh, let me see if I can just fire this up real quickly, just so you can get a flavor for Larry's style of trying to convince people to use electronic or to um, use problem-oriented records. It's kind of a unique style. Let's see if this is going to work here. Waiting. We're going to jump in the I'm leafing through this, and I'd say, geez, I'd like to know where the problems are. And you'd say, oh, come on now, doctor. We pull yourself together. You. <laughs> Did let's not, not try to make a big thing out of this record business uh, just because you happen to be interested in records. Well, uh, you know, I'm interested in nucleic acid chemistry. I've been a biochemist a lot longer than I've been fussing around in clinical medicine. And it's not that I'm so interested in records. I'm interested in medicine. I had to use these to find out what was going on. And it's got me absolutely, you know, climbing the wall. I could set it aside like I used to and say, well, never mind the record. I'll tell you all I know about pyelonephritis. But that anything to do with her. That's grand rounds on me. And that isn't what you come for. So I'd say, I'd like to know the problem. You say, well, they're at the end of the workup. Find the first workup, and you'll find the problem. So I come to hear one, and I read through this. Impression, CVA, number two, Extreme anxiety neurosis. Was well, that all the problems? All right, if that's all the problems, we can see how you diagnosed it and what you did for it. And we'll see if that's good, good care for CVA. So I'm thumbing through here. It says blood pressure 180 over 100, or 98. Thorazine. They're giving the Thorazine for a stroke. 
No, they're giving that for the anxiety, maybe. I'm not quite sure. Then what's all this SSKI? Then here, LE press times three. You know, for anxiety or a stroke? Okay. Then the x-rays of the left hip, hip and the pelvis. You get the idea. So he was very unhappy with the record, and he was trying to do with the record the same things we've done, we're trying to do today. And um, although the technology of lavalier microphones has improved a bit, um, the, uh, the technology of what's in the record has not improved that much. But what Larry wanted, if I can advance the slides without starting the video, is he wanted a problem-oriented record where you listed the problems, said what you were going to do, and you had your plans down there, and they corresponded to the record. And we do the, we've added structure to the record that does that to a certain extent. Um, we're getting there, but this was, you know, 50 years ago, so we're still, we're still working on it. But that was paper records. So then we started developing electronic records, and it's actually interesting to read Larry's papers if you go back and see how often he mentions computers in 1968. It was something like 40 times in those records, and talked about the different things computers could be doing if we computerized the records. And he did go on to develop some early computer, uh, an early uh, electronic health record system, and it kind of had his personality and as a result, didn't catch on very well, uh, but because uh, it was pretty, uh, it was pretty stringent in its requirements. So what happened when we had horse-drawn carriages and started building cars? So Larry uh, or um, uh, Doug talked about uh, early cars and physicians. So what did we do? We built horse-drawn car uh, horseless carriages, right? That that was the paradigm we had. So then we took away the the horse and we said, okay, let's you know, carriages have been around forever. Let's just have a carriage that has a motor instead of a horse. And they thought that'd be pretty good. And the first electronic health records were kind of the horse-drawn carriages. They were the horseless carriages. They were um, electronic diaries. They took the diary, they made it electronic. Now, what do you do when you have a new technology and you start figuring out, oh, okay, now we're starting to sell this thing and we can make money on this thing and we can improve it. How do we improve it? Well, we improve it by making a better horse-drawn carriage. If I can get this to advance, no? Let's try that one. There we go. So we have a better horse-drawn carriage, a fancier. And that's kind of where we are today. The systems we have today are these fancy electronic billing diaries. That's what they do. They do billing and they do diaries. And they're not helping us with the patient care process. Okay, what else could they be doing? Well, we could find ways to minimize the annoyances, reduce the alerts, make it easier to do data entry. You make it easier to find data. We've got this data overload problem. Why doesn't the system go, well, here's a huge, we've got, I've got a million things about this patient, but here's the things you need to pay attention to. Here's the important stuff right now, okay? You're seeing a patient in dentistry. You, you don't need to see the patient's whole record, but what if the patient has micro valve prolapse or, you know, something like that? Well, suddenly you're interested, right? So the system should be able to figure that out. It should be able to inform us about the patient, tell us what's going on, summarize the patient, go, here you're seeing this patient, this is what's new since the last time you saw him. Educating users, whether those users be physicians, uh, nurses, uh, dentists, caregivers, uh, patients themselves, educating whoever's using them by bringing more knowledge to the point of care at the moment that it's needed. Um, and assist with the patient care process. Instead of just saying, okay, tell me what to do. Oh, don't do that, that's not good. Don't do that, that's not good. That's how they work now. And occasionally, okay, I'll do that for you. And they go off and they do it. And then you have to go look up the result and go, oh, now I need to do this. I gotta remember to do this six months from now. The system doesn't go, well, we did a prothrombin time. Would you like one in two weeks? Because usually people do that. Uh, no, we have to remember to do that. Uh, and support research. So we wanna be able to pull data from the record to have this learning uh, health system that Doug uh, mentioned. All things we could be doing. So a national solution. So a committee uh, was formed, uh, uh, the President's Science Advisory Committee, uh, the Life Sciences Panel made this recommendation, a general purpose health record system would serve to improve the quality planning administration of health services to help in the evaluation of comparative therapies and to forward research of epidemiology and human genetics and problems of diagnosis and especially the natural history of disease. We recommend establishment of a special standing committee to guide the development of a general purpose health record system. And that was the President's Life Science Advisory Panel. Anybody want to guess the president? Just yell it out. Kennedy. Yes, Kennedy. John F. Kennedy, this is 1963. Did you know that or you're just guessing? I guessed that the National Library of Medicine was started right around Kennedy's time. This had nothing to do with the National Library of Medicine. The National Library of Medicine was started around uh, Ulysses S. Grant's time, actually. So, 
Okay, so this had nothing to do with the National Library of Medicine. <laughs> so you're just a lucky guess. Okay. Are you, is that how you do diagnosis? Also? <laughs> well, my dog had this, so. Just kidding. Thank you for blurting it out, though. Thank you for blurting. So shocking, though. Shocking, right? 1963, it took us over 50, 40, over 40 years to eventually get um, the national, the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT, which Doug was the uh, science, um, uh, science advisor for. And uh, so it took us 40 years to get a federal approach to promoting electronic health records. And so we had the Affordable Care Act. We had stimulus for some stimulus money to get people to adopt records. And what they adopt? They adopted the ones that were out there. Um, and the companies, a lot, of the, a lot of companies that were about to go under uh, because they made lousy products suddenly found themselves, you know, revitalized. Given CPR, literally, to, to, um, to uh, produce CPRs, computer patient records. Okay, so the EHR that we have is a shadow of reality. So we have, there's my person, there's my shadow. And so we think about shadows. So that's a shadow, right? That's just a shadow that we take, and it doesn't tell us everything about the teeth, but you know, we can interpret things. There's some valuable stuff there. There's a lesion there, can, nobody will see it. Um, I don't even know what it is. But we can use computers to enhance our view of that reality, all right? So we have to be creative, and we think about the change that went from a flat film x-ray to three-dimensional reconstructions from MRIs and CAT scans and such. It's a you know, revolutionary change. Well, electronic health records are in the, the flat plain film era. All right, so there's this one problem that uh, people would like to see addressed, and it's situational awareness, which, unlike many of the terms in social sciences, actually means exactly what it sounds like it means. Uh, situational or being aware of the situation, all right, and knowing what's going on uh, behind you and around you uh, and being able to act on it. So situational awareness in healthcare, there's not a lot written about this. Um, it actually is a military term, originally comes from military, and somebody, uh, Singh and Peterson Thomas, uh, in 2006 wrote a paper about trying to understand diagnostic errors by looking at uh, situational awareness, which was something used in military aviation. So they proposed that as, as a framework for medical diagnostic process. Nancy Staggers and her co colleagues uh, did a usability assessment of the VA's ambulatory uh, clinic system. Sorry, military. I'm sorry, did I say VA? Sorry, military. Um, uh, sorry? VA. Yes, yes, sorry. So the ALTA system, uh, and, and their assessment was that there was a serious problem with being able to understand the situation, of, uh, getting a, a grasp on situational awareness, that is, people would use the record and not know what the heck was going on with the patient. Uh, Les Leonard and his colleagues uh, developed a wireless electronic health record system for use in field care of, in uh, disaster situations, and they added a module that also took into account a number of aspects of the entire situation and provided that and called that situational awareness and provided that it wasn't part of the record, it was an add-on um, for them. And then uh, later, actually recently, just this last year in the Amy Fall Symposium, he wrote a very nice paper talking about how we should be documenting situational awareness and all the interesting things we could do about it if we actually knew what was going on with the patient. Because I remember being in the ICU as a, as a house officer, and I was on 28 and off 24 and on 28 and off 24, and I'd come in and I'd see my patients. They were my patients, and I'd say, man, this guy's dry. I've got to give him fluids. This guy's over, fluid overloaded. He's not peeing. I'm going to give him Lasix. And the next day, my counterpart would come in and do the opposite. Right, because we wouldn't know what was going on. So situational awareness, great idea. Let's do it. And I don't know how many of you know about South Park, um, but a little South Park reference here. Oh no, so oh, this is just the uh, publications on situational awareness, 2016. I don't think all the all the uh, papers are in Medline yet, uh, so I expect to see that go up even further. All right. So situational awareness. If you know about the underpants gnomes from South Park, great. If not, just ignore this. But they had a, a plan. They had a plan, collect underpants, phase one. Phase three, profit. And every time you ask them what was phase two, they would just uh, go, um, phase three, profit. So how do we get situational awareness in the record? It's one thing to say we need it. It's another thing to go to the practitioners and say, hey, you gotta put this in here, and in t on top of everything else you're doing, and you're gonna write it in your note, and you're gonna make that note even bigger. So all the stuff that was in there before, put more stuff in, and you know, take more time, make it more harder to read, and uh, you know, we, we need to find another way 
to solve that problem. So what's missing is a formal representation of the situation. We need to say, what is really going on here in a formal way that we can, the computer can help us with? Uh, and it has to be, it's about uh, diagnoses and symptoms and medications, and then how they all represent, how they all interrelate to each other, formal representation of that, and priorities and preferences. Does the, which, which is the patient's most important problem? Does he care about uh, his rash, or does he care about his myocardial infarction? Well, it depends on how old was the myocardial infarction, or, you know, is the myocardial infarction, is the patient, you know, terminal, and comfort care only, maybe the rash is more important than the myocardial infarction. So we, we, the computer, though, of course, is going to warn us about the things it thinks is important without knowing uh, what our priorities and plans are. So what can we afford not to miss? What's that little piece in the record that we got to make sure that we start that patient on antibiotics before he clean his teeth uh, because he's, we don't want him to get endocarditis? And what is it that it's okay to ignore, that there's the, a raft of stuff in the record that is just of no importance? So somebody who has a kidney removed, it's like, you know, okay, they had a kidney removed, not a big deal until, you know, you decide to give them something that might poison their other kidney. Um, and so what we have to do is represent the strategy, not just the tactics. The tactics are the things, the orders that we put in. So if we think about definitions of these tactics, an action or method that's planned and used to achieve a particular immediate goal. Tactics, as opposed to strategy, a careful plan for achieving a goal usually over a long period of time. So chess players um, have a strategy, but we can't see it. This is my son uh, playing when he was about five, playing chess. And, uh, you know, you can see the tactics. You can see, oh, they moved here, they moved there, they're trying to get in a position. But you don't know the strategy because they don't tell you the strategy. You, they don't want their opponent to know their ultimate strategy. Uh, in my son's case, it was world domination. Uh, <laughs> but he was only five. Hopefully he'll find another calling. Uh, but he, but, but uh, what we need to do is tell the computer system, what is our long-term goal? What is it that's, what's the point where we're going to get the patient out of the hospital? What's the, you know, what is our goal for um, this patient's mouth? Do we want to restore all the teeth? Do we need to restore the important teeth? You know, what is it that we're, we're trying to accomplish? Um, so if we look at the kind of data that are represented in first or second generation electronic health records, those, those horseless carriages, original horseless carriages, we have text, okay? Lots of text. So here's a note. This is a patient short of breath, palpitations, some vital signs, impression and plan, arrhythmia possible, atrial fibrillation, order an electrocardiogram. Okay, so that's all in text. So then we order an electrocardiogram, we get it back a report, it says atrial fibrillation, all in text. Um, now we wrote a problem list that says atrial fibrillation, plan, differential diagnosis, mitral valve disease, pulmonary embolism, hyperthyroidism, order echocardiogram, uh, arterial blood gases, thyroid function tests. Again, all in text. We order a bunch of stuff. Uh, then we notice the patient has hyperthyroidism, so our plan is cardioversion, hyperthyroidism workup, go examine the neck, because we never examined the patient's neck to see if he has a big thyroid. Oh, and then what happens next? Order, cardioversion, thyroid function, thyroid scan. Then what? Impression, plan, pulmonary embolism due to cardioversion. Okay, so all of this is in text, right? And uh, the computer is just dutifully recording it and showing it back to us. Okay, third generation, now we're starting to get the idea. We're starting to structure things. We're starting to use control terminology, as like Kenwa talked about. And that's when the computer can start to help us a little bit. All right, so now everything in bold is a controlled term or, or a term that's designating a controlled structure. So all the sections are controlled. History, vital signs, orders, physical exam, impression, plan. That's all structured. And the computer can say, if I need to look for the problem list, now I know where to look for it. Okay, but uh, only some of the data is actually uh, coded. So the vital signs are coded and they're quantified. That's easy. Laboratory results, I don't, I don't think I have any in there, but they're, they're pretty easy. Um, orders, I can, I, those are codified. Um, but the reason for the order, uh, atrial fibrillation, or the result of the EKG, is not codified. I can then put it in my problem list, but wouldn't it be nice if I could take it out of the EKG and just have that show up in the problem list because it showed up in the EKG. Why do I have to type it in? It's already in there. And so on. We have all, all that sort of stuff there. All right. So what am I proposing? I want to go to another generation. But before I do, I have to tell you a little story. I got in late last night. I was kind of hungry. Uh, the restaurants around here were closed. So I went to Dignowitz, Dignowitz uh, Meats, is barbecue. Do you know this place? It's supposed to be the best barbecue in San Antonio. And I ran into the owner there, and he was telling me that he's having trouble getting chefs to work there. I go, really? In, in, in San Antonio, you're having trouble? He goes, yeah, you'd be surprised. I said, well, what happened? He said, well, the first one was a vegan. 
And, uh, you know, he really didn't get it. He didn't do a very good job. The second one was from Alabama, and he, they just don't know how to do barbecue in Alabama, which I, and I didn't dispute him, but I, I, I did disagree with him. Uh, I said, well, what about the third one? He says, the third one was the worst of all. It was an informatician. I said, an informatician? What's wrong with that? He goes, well, instead of cooking the meat, he would come out and tell everybody how great it was going to be. <laughs> with that, let me now tell you how great it's going to be. Okay, so fourth generation electronic health records. We want to code more than just the structure and some of the data. We want to get that situation, that, reason, that, that strategy, we want to codify that. And then the computer can help us do some interesting things. So here's the stuff that's sort of coded now. And I want to relate them. I want to say, OK, the patient has these symptoms. That's, I guess that's sort of codified in there. It's implied. And the patient has this admission exam. And that's, that's sort of implied. Um, and now I have this impression of arrhythmia. But I don't say what part of all of this is giving me that impression. I just say that arrhythmia. But in the, in the fourth generation, I will say things like, oh, this, this arrhythmia, I think, is explaining the shortness of breath and the palpitations. So if I treat the arrhythmia, that'll take care of those other problems, or at least I'll, I'll look and see if they don't get better. But I'm not really worried about those. Certainly, that's what the patient's worried about. I'm going to focus on the, on the arrhythmia. Computer, help me do that, and the rest of it will take care of itself. And I can represent which of those things in there. Did I put it? I didn't put it in there, but I would say which of these things is making me think the patient has an arrhythmia, obviously the heart exam. So now I want to do a differential diagnosis. And I, put, I have in my head a differential diagnosis. I often don't put it in the record. I don't say explicitly what diseases I think this is. I just say, OK, arrhythmia, I'm going to do a test. But I don't say what I'm thinking. All right? Because if I did, the computer would go, oh, you don't want to do that test. There's a better test for that. And, and so I'm stuck with whatever I know from when I trained in the 80s. Uh, I'm going to remember that and not know to use the better test. So OK, so what I tell a differential diagnosis is that now it can say, OK, then you want to use an EKG, an ECG, to, uh, to make the diagnosis. Great. The diagnosis confirms atrial fibrillation. So now I have a diagnosis. So my impression of arrhythmia is now sort of resolved into this other problem. And that explains now these other things. Now what? Well, it also explains physical findings. So I can talk about those. And I can relate physical findings to the diagnosis. And those are also. And now I'm going to treat. So one of the things I'm going to do is treat with digoxin. I'm going to slow down the ventricular uh, rate. And uh, now when I do that, I've got to monitor things. And the computer knows I'm treating atrial fibrillation. I chose digoxin. So there are th certain things I'm going to monitor. And the monitoring I do will be different than if I were using digoxin for heart failure. OK, because now I don't care about the level as much. I care about the heart rate. And I care about the vital signs. And so I'm tying those back to there. So when I start representing that, the computer now can say, OK, now I know what parts of the record are important to show you. All right, what else can we do? Well, I've got atrial fibrillation. That's not really a diagnosis. That's a condition. What's the underlying cause? Well, I can then say, here are the things I'm thinking about, these three conditions. I wrote it in my note. If you remember, it was in the text. Now I make it explicit, not only coding the terms, but saying what their role is in this situation. And so now I'll use a couple of tests to help me discriminate between the possible causes of atrial fibrillation. Okay, and then when I go to order the thyroid function test, the, the, the third generation system will send an alert and say, hey, thyroid function tests were done recently. You don't need to do them again. But the system will go, oh, hey, alert, shut up. We've got a new reason to do these tests, and we're going to repeat them. And so the alert holds its tongue. It doesn't fatigue us, and it lets us go ahead. All right, we get our thyroid function test. We find out, aha, patient has hyperthyroidism. Great. So now we know the atrial fibrillation is due to hyperthyroidism. And so now, to treat the shortness of breath, we treat the hyperthyroidism, which is not typically a cause of shortness of breath, but we're going to treat the proximal causes and fix everything down the line. OK. And we're going to treat with cardioversion. Well, it turns out cardioversion isn't a great treatment for atrial fibrillation. It's been around for more than two weeks, or more than a couple of days, actually. This has been around two weeks. So now the system goes, wait a minute, you're going to do cardioversion. And you're doing it for atrial fibrillation, but this patient's had symptoms which you're attributing to the atrial fibrillation. So the patient's had atrial fibrillation for two weeks. Don't do the, on the, um, the cardioversion. And so it will, now it'll give me an alert that's actually relevant that it would not have been able to do before. All right? And so the end of that story is not treating the patient for pulmonary embolism. It's anticoagulating the patient, sending him home happy, have him come back in a, couple, in a month, and then we cardiovert him, and so on. Okay, so it can do all these things. It can start my workup for hyperthyroidism. 
It can empower info buttons to provide just in time knowledge because info buttons are links from the record out to other knowledge resources that are actually uh, tailored for the specific patient's specific situation uh, that is going on. So the more you tell it, the better it can do it, bringing right, just the right information back. Um, it can help you identify the goal, uh, which is for anticoagulation. When you anticoagulate patients, it depends on why you're doing it. If you're doing it because they have atrial fibrillation and you want to prevent an embolism, it's one level. If they've already had one, they've had a stroke, it's a much more aggressive plan. If it's, uh, you know, just some, they're, they're in bed for a long time and you want to make sure they don't get clots in their legs, it's a different thing. So ordering anticoagulation, the goal state, depends on knowing why you're doing it. And it can suggest tests like, hey, you better do a pregnancy test before you start the patient on that medication. It's a, it's a childbearing age female. Uh, and it can look at the role of genetics and say, oh, you better change the dose of that or don't use this one because it won't work in that patient. Uh, and so now we can do personalized uh, goal-based drug selection and dosing. And then we can set up the plan for cardioversion and say, don't forget to bring that patient back in a month. We're going to do the cardioversion. And these are all stories taken, except for the pregnancy part, stories about my mom who, uh, who periodically shows, goes to the hospital. She doesn't call, I find out she's in the hospital after she's getting discharged. Uh, but she goes in, oh, they didn't treat me well this time. What happened this time? Well, they, they gave me this drug and they forgot that I had this other problem. And why didn't you tell them? Well, I forgot. Well, wasn't it in the record while well, I went to a different hospital? Uh, but even if they go, when she goes to the same hospital, they can't find everything that's in that record. All right. And the last thing you can do is write the note. All right. Not write a note, write the note. So wouldn't it be nice if at the end of every day, somebody sat down with the record and went through the whole thing and said, well, the ophthalmologist said this, and the dentist said this, and the physician, the cardiologist said this, and wrote one note about what's going on with the patient, what's everybody's plan, you could see that in one place. I believe that we can get there if we do this deeper representation. Let me show you what that would look like. So I can pull up the vital signs, because I put those in, and then the, the impression, I can pull that up. I, natural language generation is a lot easier than natural language processing. So let me read this. It says, Dr. Semino attributes patients' shortness of breath and palpitations to underlying atrial fibrillation. Differential diagnosis included microvalve disease, pulmonary embolism, hyperthyroidism, laboratory tests confirm hyperthyroidism. Okay. All of that could be generated from that knowledge structure. That's not, that's not hard to do. Then there's a plan to treat the atrial fibrillation expected to improve the patient's symptoms. Remember, because I, I related those. Treatment plan include evaluation and treatment of the cause of the hyperthyroidism and electrocardioversion. Evaluation of her hyperthyroidism includes physical exam of the patient's neck, TSH, thyroid scan, et cetera, et cetera. Patient will be treated in the interim with propranolol to control her ventricular response rate because her symptoms have been present for two weeks. Atrial fibrillation seem to be sub, uh, subacute, requiring anticoagulation, et cetera, et cetera, based on genetics and dot, dot, dot. Okay, so I believe we could write that note if we could get people to put in the situation in a formal way. All right, so how are we going to do this? We've got to change the electronic health record. It's already there. We can't rip it out, build a new one, and put it in place. It's not going, to, not going to work. And electronic health records do certain things well, uh, and I don't want to have to recreate those. Um, so my original metaphor was uh, parasitism. So if you know what a strangler fig is, a strangler fig starts as a vine. It grows around another tree. It uses that to get up and into the canopy. Uh, but it doesn't just stop there. It actually envelops the tree. And it becomes a tree itself, and the inside, the tree inside dies and decays, but the strangler fig now is a tree in its own right. It doesn't need that of the tree. So my original plan was to build little pieces of the EHR, of the EHR and add them on uh, and integrate them in various ways that we could talk about another time, um, but eventually replace the entire EHR with these other pieces that would grow around it that would have an idea of the situation, et cetera, et cetera. The vendors didn't like this model, so when I go talk to them, they were they, you know, kind of turned off immediately that I wanted to kill their product. So I, but I came up with a better metaphor. I was in a lecture on mitochondrial DNA. So this is a cell, electron micrograph, there's a mitochondria. And the, and the speaker was talking about the DNA of mitochondria and showed this picture or something like it. Um, so you may know mitochondria are archaic bacteria that infected a prokaryotic cell a long, long time ago and replicated within the cell, and, but they provide a service. They didn't kill the cell, they actually provide a function. Uh, they produce uh, adenosine triphosphate and they do a lot of other things. But, uh, and the cell was very happy to have them in there. And so I said, uh, you know, I looked at it, and I said, is that a schematic for the, for the DNA of the, of the mitochondria? And he said, no, no, that's the whole genome. I go, how could that be? It's so simple. There's, you know, each of those colors is a gene. That doesn't seem like there's enough there for, the, for a bacteria to be free living. What happened to the rest of the genome? And sure enough, so this, this particular cell also has bacteria in it. 
there's a bacteria. The bacterial genome looks like that, much, much more complicated. So what happened? What happened was that the host cell took on the genetic tasks of the uh, bacteria. And a lot of the, gen the things that the mitochondria needs to function are produced by our, um, the prokaryotic cell, um, or eukaryotic cell, sorry, um, DNA. So it's a gradual process. And my idea is we will gradually move these data, these pieces of information, will move into the EHR because the vendors will go, oh, I can use that, I can use that. And they'll add functions to their system that will actually take advantage of this. And there's a lot of other pieces to this puzzle. I don't have time to go into them. I'm not sure you'd be all that interested. I'm enthusiastic about them because I think it's really going to work. All right, so um, the evolutionary steps, we have to identify these situational concepts and relationships. This is informatics research. We have to figure out what is it that we really want to represent. I gave some examples in there. I don't think it's that complicated. And the examples I gave seem reasonable, but they, we certainly need to expand them and we need to test them. We don't just build a bunch of stuff because Samino said and put it in there. That would be a disaster. Um, then we construct a user interface to figure out how to capture this. And we're going to have to be thoughtful about this. Things like some of the pieces of the record occur in the, in the clinician's mind throughout the day uh, in response to things that happen or in the middle of a procedure. We've got to capture those thoughts at that time and put them in the record so they're there when, when we want to summarize at the end of the day. Then we have to change education, which is why I went to UAB uh, from NIH, because I realized that I wasn't going to, even if I could build this at NIH, I'd never convince the physicians there to use it because their training didn't include an understanding of why they would want to go through the trouble of putting this information into the record. And then we can improve the benefit uh, effort ratio for, for the system. All right, so what's going to happen? We're gonna, we've got to have better data entry. We're going to have better user interfaces with searching and navigation. We want to reduce data, redundant. Uh, data entry. We're going to integrate uh, health information exchange so we can pull data from other sources. And Doug talked about um, interoperability this morning, and that's a key part of it. But of course, if we just do the interoperability, we'll bring more data in and we'll, and we'll create more uh, data overload. So we have to be able to do it when we're ready to handle it. Um, we can have smarter alerts and reminders. We can do this just in time education for decision support. And we can have our learning health system because it's, it'll be a lot easier to learn from the patient's records when the patient's records actually say what was going on, as opposed to just looking for correlations and doing machine learning and go, gee, 90% of the patients that had this had this. So maybe that's what, you know, what's going on. There'll be a lot, there's a lot of noise in there. And when you have large sets of records, you can, you know, you can eliminate the noise. When you have rare diseases, not so much, there's not enough records to eliminate the noise. Here, we'll, we could be able to tell what's really going on and learn from that. Okay. How am I doing on time? I think I was talking too fast. Oh, good. I am good. Okay. For change. Um, okay. So let me just recap quickly. And then I have the, my little insight that I got at lunch. Uh, so what do we have today? We have a billing diary. That's what we have today. What do we need? We need formal situation representation. Challenges are going to be informatics, design, education. So there's a lot of things. We can't just build it and they will come. We'll build it, and they do what they do today. They go, I don't know why it's asking me this. Click, 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 click. Get it out of my way, right? We do these, you know, there's just, uh, I saw this in several systems where it says, okay, these things are in the record. Which is a problem? Which is a diagnosis? Which is past medical history? And, and I saw that in, in, in Cerner and Epic, and I asked the people in charge. I said, what's the difference between a problem and a diagnosis? And they said, um, I'm not sure. I go, well, if you don't know, as an as a owner of the system, and I don't know as an informatician, how is the physician going to know when, what, what to answer the question? So what they're going to do, and I found out later, what I got a hint, because at one point I tried to make a problem, a past medical history, and it said, you can't do that. I, and then I was like, why not? And it said, only, disease, only diagnoses can be past medical history. Like, aha, a problem is like this temporary thing, like the atrial fibrillation, and then you turn it into another diagnosis, and then that can be past medical history. So I'm getting an inkling as an informatician, figuring out what the system's doing. The poor clinician's going to go, who cares? Click, 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 click. They're all problems. They're all past medical, whatever it is. So not only won't the system be able to help them with whatever it was going to do with that information, it might do the wrong thing. It might fail to warn them of something because, oh, well, you said it was past medical history. Well, doctor, would you care to explain to the jury why you uh, clicked uh, past medical history in the decedent's record? And, and you know, we're, we're going to get in trouble if we do that. So we've got the education as a key piece of this. So the way forward is going to be incremental. We're going to have to build some, some sort of critical mass piece that does something useful, teach people what it does and why they have to put the information in, and make sure that that piece doesn't even, not only does something extra useful, 
but removes some work too. Somehow reduces not just the complications the patient, oh, well, you know, if I, this patient didn't get pulmonary embolism, aren't you glad you spent an extra 20 minutes putting data in everybody's record? You know, it's got to be something more tangible than that. The next generation electronic health, re health record will be an intelligent assistant. I think about a medical student or an intern who, you know, doesn't, is certainly not autonomous, can't go off and take care of the patient themselves, um, but if you give them some instructions, they can go off and do what you tell them. Say, hey, this patient's got this problem, go watch him. If he starts looking bad, call me, you know. Well, you know, you could tell a computer, if it knew what the heck it was looking for, it could do that too. Um, so we need to think about how we turn the computer into an intelligent assistant. Okay, so this is, I got this, I was talking to Ankit uh, Sang, Sang, Sang Gabi, I'm sorry, thank you, um, at lunch. And we were talking about electronic, and he says, well, we don't have records yet. I thought, oh, you're lucky you don't have records yet, because you have an opportunity. And I, my dentist in, in, in Birmingham has a record. And I sit there staring at this record. My teeth are a mess, so it's a very colorful screen. And um, I'm looking at this thing, and I'm, you know, I'm looking. I'm going, oh, okay, look at that. It's got a lot of its visual graphic, you know, symbols. So there's a lot of gold and black and other colors. And um, so I, I uh, you know, I was looking at that thing and thinking, you know, I kind of understand how it works. It kind of makes sense. It looks really cool. And then I started thinking about what we have. So, so this is a picture of a statue. It's a collection of statues in England in the, um, in the uh, tidal flats. And at high tide, these statues are covered. Uh, and these statues are now covered with barnacles, OK? So that, not too surprising. Our electronic health records are like, are like this statue. So we build this beautiful thing and go, look at this wonderful statue. And then they, somebody comes along and says, oh, we have to add this another feature to this. And you go, uh-oh, well, the system doesn't do that. And if I go and change what's in there now, it might break. So let me add that on as a new piece, as a new module. That's okay, it'll be a new mod. Oh, you want to do this thing? Here's the module for that. And then we start adding all these things on until it looks like we've got, we're just covered with these barnacles of new pieces until we can't even see the system that's underneath anymore because we've added all these things. That's where we are. That's our state of, our, of the art. And it's going to be tricky to chip away at those barnacles and replace them with something useful. The dental community doesn't have the barnacles yet. You're, you're, still, you're still using paper to a large degree. And so you have an opportunity to do something different. One of the things that's key that I didn't really talk about was having a formal representation of the patient so that you can say the patient has a particular state, has particular attributes like his blood pressure or his diagnosis or the medications he's getting. These are all in one place. The current electronic health records, the medication list is all over the place. There's four or five places you could look. There's the outpatient orders. There's the inpatient orders. The outpatient note, the inpatient note. There's the history, the past medical history. It's all over the place. There's no one place where we get together and go, this is what the patient is on. And if you want to know what it is, look here. Don't look anywhere else. Look here. And if you're going to change what the patient is on, don't just add it in some other module. Change it here. So when you have a model of what's going on with the patient and you have everybody agreed on how to change that model, then you can do some very interesting things. So the, the record that I look at looks kind of like this. This guy's teeth are a lot better than mine. Um, but look at that graphic. So there's a nice graphic. I can drag one of those things over and go, nope, this tooth has a hole. This tooth is missing. And I, just, I don't have to write anything. I just do it graphically. It's, you know, my, my nine-year-old son would love this because he plays Minecraft, and that looks exactly like Minecraft to him. So uh, visual user interface. But more importantly, when I look at this, I go, that tooth, whatever one, pick one, is the, is the gold standard representation of every, all the information about that tooth. Anything that's going to change or is going to remove the tooth, they're going to drill the tooth, and whatever, is going to change that underlying data. And of course, the image is driven from the data. Okay? I flew here yesterday from Birmingham, and the flight coming into Birmingham, depending on where I looked on the web, I saw two different arrival times. One was going to be a minute late, and the other was going to be an hour late. And I went to the gate agent. I said, um, I'm trying to figure out, is the plane going to late? She goes, yeah. I said, how late? She goes, well, either a minute or an hour. And I, so she had the same problem. Somewhere in that system, there were two different places. One probably was the right one, and one hadn't been updated. But we couldn't tell which was which. And so but here, you have an opportunity to model what you need to know. At least this one. This doesn't look too complicated. It looks like we could do this. And believe me, I would love to have this kind of a model of my patient's organ systems. And, and medications and everything. So when I look at the heart, I can go, here's the problems in the heart. And here's the drugs that are affecting the heart. And have that all draw, just draw it. That'd be great. But of course, education. We need nine-year-olds to come in and do our electronic records. OK, so that's my, that's my talk. I hope it uh, was helpful and relevant. And I'm happy to take questions. Yes?
course. I'm not I'm agnostic about what the, the data sources are, and, and I don't have time to tell you about my sort of personal history, but I've been, for the last 30 or so years, I've been building repositories of data from multiple sources and integrating them into one place. I think one, one aspect which I think will be very beneficial for us if, if you could spend a minute or two talking about is um, what the role of the electronic health record should be in relation to patients themselves. And there are many aspects to it, like, you know, sure. doc doctor autonomy and... Yeah, yeah, oh, sure. So, so I don't, maybe, because in the, I think that's also another unexplored area yeah. in the dental record, yeah. which I yeah. think... Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, and I've been to places, I've been to meetings where there are patient advocates and, oh, we want to have our record, control of our record, et cetera. And none of those people ever came to me as a patient. My patients are all more like, you know, how you take your care of your car. Unless you, unless, like most people, you don't fix your own car. You go to an auto body place, you drop your car off, and, and then you come back later and pick it up. That's how people want to treat their health care. They want to go to the doctor and go, here's my body. Uh, give me a beeper. I'm going to go shopping. Let me know when it's done, and I'll come back and take care of it. People don't want to think about them being sick. They want to just give me a pill. It's going to make me better, and I, you know, as I don't want to think about being sick. It's too depressing. Some people, you know, a lot of people do care about their health, but I'm from Alabama now, and it's a little different there. I mean, people, you know, it's a, the, certainly there are people who care about knowing everything in the record. There are a lot of people who don't care, don't want to know. Just I built an electronic health record system for patients to access their own record in 1998. And what patients did with it overwhelmingly was they looked in there to see if the results were back, and we built all these info buttons and all these other things to explain the results. They never used that. They didn't care what the result meant. They cared that the result was back so they could call the doctor and say, hey, doc, my labs are back in the system. Tell me what they mean, what, you, what I should do. So they didn't care about seeing them. They just wanted to see they were done. We could have saved a lot of time and effort <laughs> if, we, if we knew that and knew that's what they want. Not everybody. everybody there's a lot of differences. So, but what's the patient's role? Well, I think we can find ways to collect data from the patient and offload some of that data collection that's happening now. For example, travel history. Okay, travel history, very important. Uh, you know, somebody who's in a, in a place where there's Ebola uh, two weeks ago and now comes into the emergency room with a fever and somebody goes, where were you? They go, I went to Africa, where in Africa? Uh, you know, and they say, that, and they go, Cameroon, and they go, well, uh, isn't Cameroon, isn't that like near, you know, Egypt? They're, they're, you know, if they're like most Americans, they're not going to know where Cameroon is, let alone that it's a hot spot for Ebola. So if we could collect that information to get the patient, the patient knows where they were. And they're not going to know any better where they were if we quiz them. They know where they are. So let's build a where in the world is Carmen San Diego game. Let the patients come in and say, I was here, I was here, this is when I was there, and do this whole history so that I, the patient, don't, I don't have to go in and repeat it every time I come in. Just keep track of it. You know, I can put it in for the clinician. Family history, another example. I know whatever I know about my family history, and you can quiz me all I want, and I'm not going to know what kind of cancer my mom had. Uh, you know, I'm just going to say cancer, I don't know what kind. So is it relevant to me? Was it ovarian cancer or you know, was it bone cancer? So um, I think there's certainly things we could do to get the patients to contribute to their record. We can also ask patients about preferences. You know, they fill out stuff for websites all the time saying, you know, I like this, I don't like that. Let's get use that technology, that approach, to find out patient preferences so that when we're trying to address the patient's issues, we know what is the most important to the patient and make sure, maybe they're not medically the most important, but if they're the most important to the patient, we at least want them to make sure, make sure they feel that we are recognizing and acknowledging their, you know, the problem and say, okay, I understand you're really worried about this. Um, my, you know, from what we can tell, it's not life-threatening. It's certainly uncomfortable. We understand that. Here's what we're going to do about it. Meanwhile, you have this other problem that we really need to take care of. And, uh, you know, that's, and the patient may say, I don't care about that. Okay, fine, and let's note that, and the patient gets to decide. So I think there's a lot we could do with very clever um, data capture, but patients are going to have to go to patient school. Now, we send doctors to doctor school, nurses to nursing school. Patients don't know how to be patients. They don't know how to give a history. They don't know what their job is. They come in and go, did you take your pills? Yeah, what are you on? I don't know, whatever you gave me. Well, yeah, that's not really convincing, right? Not reassuring. So patients have to know that they have to know what they're on and then be able to tell what they're doing for their health care when they're out there the 99% of the time that they're not in a health care situation. Patients don't understand what it is. I'm not talking about teaching, oh, here's how you take care of your feet if you're a diabetic. I'm talking about 
how do you be a, a party in this system, this complex thing uh, that we call the healthcare system? More than a minute, sorry. Yeah, other? Hey, I didn't ask you any questions. <laughs> yeah, not my, you, you missed your chance. So I just wanted to go back to your observation of like one minute late or one hour late. And one problem with that, uh, one, one cause of that problem in the EHR scenario is that doctors are very reluctant to change what is already on the record. For example, allergy, once it's in there, then nobody, no one is going to delete it, even if that's already proven to be wrong. Or a problem is there, then another doctor of another specialty, I mean, they would not be I mean, right. willing so, to change. Right, so, so that's because what we represent when we do allergy is, we say, here's the patient's allergies. Those aren't the patient allergies. We have knowledge about patients' adverse reactions to drugs, some of which are allergies. We lump them all into allergies, but you know, we're getting around that. We're getting away from that. But you know, let's just talk about allergies. I've had patients tell me they're allergic to penicillin, and when I say, so what happens when you get penicillin? To find out, do you get a rash, do you get a swollen throat, do you throw up? You know, because some of those aren't allergies. Uh, and they go, they look at me like I'm stupid. I don't take penicillin. And I go, no, no, I know that. But if you, if you were to take penicillin, what happened? You go, well, I don't take it. I go, when, the, when you did take it, well, I've never taken it. Well, how do you know you're allergic to it? Well, my parents are allergic, right? So, you know, so I have to verify now, what do I put, if I was really going to model this, I would say patient believes she is allergic to, to penicillin because her parents are allegedly, who knows what they, maybe their parents were allergic, so allegedly allergic to penicillin. And now when somebody comes along and says, is the patient allergic to penicillin, it would say the patient believes she is, but there's no objective evidence of that. And now the patient really, really, really needs penicillin. And so it's worth it. I'm going to take a risk. And I'll have some steroids ha handy, you know, Decadron handy, just in case she starts getting a reaction. But I'm going to say, listen, I know you, you think you're allergic. There doesn't seem to be any evidence. You really need this drug. We're going to be ready to treat the side effect. You, you know what I mean? So, you, so we record what we know, not just some statement that somebody's going to come and go, well, I don't know where that statement comes from. And I am reluctant to overturn that based on my history. But if it, nobody has ever recorded the allergy, we, we should represent that in the record. So what we should represent is what our main impression is. Dr. Semino's impression is the patient does not have this allergy. And then somebody can come in and see, OK, so this is, this is the history of this particular problem. Um, whether the patient's really allergic, I don't know. But if we did skin testing, we could record the results of the skin testing. And we could say, OK, this patient had, a, had this kind of reaction to the penicillin on the skin test. And now we can use that in our judgment about whether or not the patient really is allergic. That's just a shadow of the patient. We can't pretend it's actually the patient in that record. Yeah. I love your comment about um, integrated information resources. And you talked about you know, educating. Particularly what I'm going be talking about would be the providers. So this is a little bit more pragmatic. But how do you see us getting from where we are now to really having a smart electronic patient record that you know, algorithms may be built in where the information resources are presented to the clinician about Well, so the, those the knowledge part, the, the, the just-in-time knowledge is actually a, a solved problem. Um, it's, the trick is knowing enough about the situation to be able to narrow down things. So when I did work on something called info buttons, and, and originally I thought, I won't go with the whole story, but um, the first one I built, nobody used it. They said, oh, it works great, but I don't want to use it because I was asking, I was trying to answer the wrong question. Um, I, I built something, you know, so that people would look under the street light for their keys when their keys were lost in the dark, but the light's better under the street light, so they looked at right? So it was a, uh, but now, then I started studying. I did observational studies of people in, had them think aloud in real world settings, seeing real patients, to find out what are their information needs and what is it about the context that will let me predict that that, emer that information need is arising. So in the inpatient side, nobody cares what a medication looks like, but in the outpatient setting, they care about it all the time. So if I'm seeing a patient in the outpatient setting, and I'm looking at the medication list, and there's an info button there, one of the questions that it will pop up is, what does this medication look like? And I click it, and it'll be a picture. And I go to the patient, hey, is that, is that the medicine you're talking about? And I go, no, that's not it. And I click it, is that it? Yeah, that's it. So that question doesn't arise in the inpatient. We don't need it there. I need patient instructions in the outpatient setting. In the inpatient setting, I need something else. Um, so observational studies and really understanding the information needs then lets us build some of these things that are smart enough to figure out, well, you're asking this question in the inpatient setting, you're a cardiologist, so you probably don't need this, but you might need some other things. 
Um, it's a childbearing age female, so maybe you were curious about pregnancy risk or you know whatever. We can tailor them to a certain extent. We could do a much better job if we had that other information. But that just-in-time information actually is a solved problem. We just don't. We just have to make the record smarter so that those things can be better informed. And they're pretty cool when they when they work. They're pretty, they look pretty cool. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. You. Oh, what? One more. Actually, it was already mentioned. Uh, I think health informatics is very important to be integrated in the curriculum of medical, you know, sciences, all medical sciences, dental sciences, nursing, all of that. In the means of, it was already mentioned, as I said, but in the means uh, uh, of, if we would like really to develop this science, we should make all the students aware of that in the beginning. Maybe some of the students, even 1% of the students got interested, they will be involved in the future and really will build up this science. However, if they're not, they will be aware of, and uh, again, it will be great if we insist that should, that should be part of the continuing education when people graduate. So they keep up with that, they might be part of it, they are aware of it when the nurse, uh, you know, uh, communicate with the dentist or with the, um, you know, uh, physician, they will all know what they are talking yeah. about. Yeah, so, so that's a good, a good point. And, you know, it's, I think it's helpful to think about teaching informatics at several different levels. There's a level of, so, so here's what informatics is, here's the field of informatics, give you a little bit of a flavor, like we teach pharmacology. You know, we don't teach pharma, we teach pharmacology to medical students and dental students. They're not going to go out and be pharmacologists, most of them, but some of them will. And most of them just get exposed to the field, and then we start, okay, now memorize all these drugs, right? And they understand some of the underlying theories behind it, but you know, 10 years later, they don't remember that stuff, but they remember what it is about the drugs, except the ones that we're really interested in, say, oh, I, I think that pharmacology stuff's cool. I'm gonna go do research in that area, or I'm gonna do development in that area. So, that, so teaching informatics like that is important to let people realize it's actually a field that they could pursue. When we taught informatics to the medical students at Columbia, oh boy. They were really mad because we had taken an open slot they were supposed to use to study for the boards and they, the school said, okay, you want to teach informatics? Use this slot on their schedule. And they were not happy, but I can tell you, they just, they just sat there the whole time. And the comments they wrote were things like, if you need to use a computer to take care of a patient, you're not a real doctor. Or if you, you know, um, air conditioners are important in hospitals too, but I don't have to know how an air conditioner works to work in a hospital. So, you know, that was the sort of mentality. And these are Columbia students, so, you know, you've got to take it with a grain of salt. But, they, but, you know, without telling them why it's important, then it's sort of lost on them. So teaching people about, okay, here's what an electronic medical record does, and here is why you do this. So this isn't teaching them how to build electronic health records, teaching them how to use something, but how the information is going to actually be used. My son plays Minecraft, and he puts a chicken in a lava tube. He knows what's going to happen to the chicken, and he knows why he's doing it. Right? But, we, but people are writing orders, the system's asking them all these questions, they have no idea whether answering the question accurately is going to help them or the patient because they don't know what it's doing. So we need to teach them more, but of course the system has to be able to do more before we do that. So it's a, you know, going to be an incremental thing. So there's, there are different levels of informatics. I don't think going and pe teaching people knowledge representation in medical school, really, other than maybe five minutes to show them like I showed you, oh, you could do this under the hood, might be interesting. But beyond that, they're, they're, not going to be, they're not going to care about it. But learning how to use informatics tools, how to do effective information retrieval, we certainly do that now. But we don't teach them how to use electronic health records. And we don't teach them how to write a note that actually conveys what they're thinking. We spend maybe half a day, you know, here's how you take a history, here's how you do a physical. Okay, now write a note. Then we send them out to the residencies and we go, okay, at the end of the day, when you've done all your real work, write notes on your patients. And by the way, get out of the hospital by 5 p.m. or we're all going to get fined. So now, they've got to write their notes in two minutes. How good are the notes going to be? They don't know why they're doing it. It's not part of their real job. So it suffers. We've got to change that. We've got to make them realize that writing their note or the documentation in the system is not a side job. It's the job. OK, am I Any other questions? discharged? <laughs> Thank you, Dr. You dentists never know when to let me go. Thank you. Thank you.